Greeting to each one of you in the name of Jesus, and a good morning to you. Glad for the presence of each one here, and uh, trust that you've come to worship, and also welcome to those online, welcome to the visitors. Turn your Bibles to the 145th Psalm. Just in the last uh, week or so, uh, this text has really been an inspiration to me and my personal devotions, and uh, I, I thought I had another message lined up, but uh, God derailed that one, and I turned to this, uh, this scripture instead. The, uh, some of the Bible uh, commentators and studies, Bible, uh, Bible studies, have entitled this, mess- this chapter, The Unblemished Righteousness. Um, a song of God's majesty and uh, love by David. It's, it's one of the final hallels in the Psalms. Of course, the, the hymns of praise from uh, the 113th Psalm to the 118th are called the Hallel Psalms. And they were psalms that they sang at Passover time in the, in the Pentecost festival and also during the tabernacle festivals those were were called the Hallel Psalms and of course and then the, the 145th Psalm to the 150th to the end of the Psalter those are also uh, called the final Hallels and uh, this one was written by David so I want to go through this and I want to focus on verses uh, in closing on verses 17 through 20. Uh, make that the final point. But I'm going to go through the, the whole psalm and just talk about some of the scriptures. In verse 1 and 2, David says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Then he says, every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Just a few thoughts on these two verses. David says, I will. And again, he says, I will. He says, every day will I. I will praise thy name. Not when I feel like it. Not uh, once I have my list of things to do done. At the end of the day, then, Lord, I will praise thee. David was a king, so David was probably a busy man. There was a lot expected of him. People probably wanted his audience, wanted his attention. But David said, every day, Lord, I'm going to bless you. Every day, I will praise you. It was a commitment that he made. To bless there means to kneel before the Lord. And he says he will do it forever and ever, every day. It was part of his daily schedule. That, when I I thought of that, I said, ouch. I wondered, is that part of my daily schedule? To praise the Lord, to bless the Lord. And David recognized God as his sovereign. Then in verse 3 through 7, David spends some time speaking of the greatness of the Lord. How his greatness is unsearchable, never ending. I'm sure that there's times when you experience that, when you sit down to read the Word of God, and you read something and you say, Ah, I never noticed that before. Ah, that's, that's new to me. That's the way the Word of God is. That's the way God is. <clears throat> He's unsearchable. In other words, it means that the newness of God will never wear out or wear off. Uh, then he says, One generation shall praise thy works to another. God's praises are many. Man's life is short. And uh, David said, I will declare his, your greatness. 
they shall abundantly utter the memory. He was talking about Israel. The phrase there, utter the memory, in the Hebrew, in Hebrew it would mean bubbling over. Or something that overflows from within you. And you gush with memory. So, parents, this morning, when was the last time you told your story of salvation to your children? I know you think, well, my story is not so important. And maybe, yes, you're right. Your story is not so important. But the story of God's work in your life is not your story. It's God's story. And if it's God's story of salvation that you've experienced, then it is important. That's what makes it important. Because it is God's story. How you became a new creature in Christ. How old things were passed away and all things became new. And within you. And uh, if, if it was your story, it would be blemished in unrighteousness. But if it is God's story, it's an unblemished righteous, it's unblemished righteousness. And so I, I believe it's important, and I'm talking to myself. And I had to ask myself the question. When was the last time I talked about my story? And abundantly uttered my story. Let it just gush forth in my life with enthusiasm. David said, this is what Israel did from one generation to the next. They went back and they rehearsed the stories of God leading Israel out of Egypt. And the wonders and the great things that God did. And it was not their story, but it was God's story. And that's what makes it important. Then in verses 8 through 13, David gives a discourse to us about God's great grace. He says, The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. And this morning in Sunday school, we talked about, and the theme of the lesson was God's compassion towards human suffering. And I, I remember years ago when I was in West Africa in Liberia and they took me around, they showed me orphanages and they went and took me to widows' houses and coming back that evening it was hot, I was tired and I was angry because here was children and widows and humans were suffering because of the evil of man. They were victims and I was just angry inside. And I had to think of Jesus and his compassion. And I'm sure the man that was, was possessed by a demon was a victim. Jesus had compassion on him. People mocked him to score and laughed at him. He had compassion. And so the God is gracious. He's full of compassion, David says, slow to anger and of great mercy. David echoes the words of Moses from Exodus 34 Verse 6, and Myron, you can bring the screen down. We want to quote that scripture together. This is when Moses appeared the second time on Mount Sinai to receive the, ta the tables, the tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments written on them. And remember the first time that Moses went to Mount Sinai and received the tablets, or God wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablets. And he came back down the mountain. And Aaron was left in care of the children of Israel. And they had a golden calf. And they were worshiping and dancing around the golden calf. And Moses, after spending 40 days on the mountain, in the presence of the Lord, took those tablets and he threw them to the ground and he broke them. Now Moses again is summoned into the presence of God the second time. And if, like I said, if you had been like me, uh, 
Would you have given the children of Israel a second chance? Uh, Moses was angry. But God is a God of second chances. And he summons Moses to the mountain. And he tells Moses to bring two tablets along. Again. And he was going to write the Ten Commandments on those tablets. Remember, when Moses came back down, he asked Aaron, what is going on here? And Aaron said, well, we just threw our gold into the fire and bam, out came this golden calf. We started worshiping it. So Moses had a reason to be angry. The Lord commanded Moses to hew out these tablets of stone and come up before him. And this is what the Lord says. He testifies of himself to Moses. Moses came up on the mountain and the Lord came down and he was in the cloud. And he passed before Moses. And the Lord passed before Moses. Exodus uh, 34 says, verse 6, The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, he uses, he, he, he says it twice. He repeats it to emphasize his own unchangeableness. He says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. So let's, let's stand together. Everybody stand up. And let's say that together. All together. Okay, ready? The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Let's say it again. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Thank you. You may be seated. That is awesome. That's the God that we have, the God that we serve. But it's interesting to note that the Lord shares these attributes of himself with us as believers. By the endowment of the Holy Spirit, we are enabled and expected to demonstrate these spiritual fruits in our own lives. Being merciful, being gracious, being long-suffering, being abundant in goodness, and being true. God shares these attributes of himself with us as believers. Then the following verses, verse 9, the Lord is good to all in this psalm. David expresses the idea that, that is some, sometimes considered as common goodness. God is good to all of humanity. Even the wicked. God is good to the wicked. He's, Jesus said he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. And David saw the mercies of God in all of his creation. Verse 10 through 13, David goes on. He says, all your works shall, all your works shall praise you. And your saints shall bless you or worship you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. They talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his strength. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Do we speak of those things about the greatness and the goodness of God? Here's a quote by Spurgeon. He says, I consider that one of the great lacks of the church is not so much Christian preaching as Christian talking. Not so much Christian prayer in the prayer meeting as Christian conversation in the parlor. How little do we hear concerning Christ? daily walk of life. Do you talk about Jesus? In your everyday conversation, 
Do you include Jesus Christ in your conversation about him, about his goodness, his graciousness, his mercy? And Spurgeon said that is one thing that the church lacks is in their not so much Christian preaching as Christian talking about the goodness of God and the greatness of God. Then in verse 14 through 16, David speaks of God's unfailing faithfulness. He says, the Lord upholds all who fall down. He raises up all who are bowed down. And he says, the Lord is near to those who humbly acknowledge their need to him. Verse 15, the eyes of the righteous are turned towards a faithful God. In other words, what David is saying is the righteous do not take their daily blessings for granted. They recognize that God is the giver of all things that we have. The blessings that are granted to us. And they are willing to acknowledge God as a giver of all good and perfect gifts. Part of the model prayer that we pray. We say, give us this day our daily bread. We just came through the season of thanksgiving. Thankfulness. Is that a daily part of your life? In Luke chapter 17, Jesus healed the ten lepers. All of them were healed. All of them followed the religious ceremony of going and showing themselves to the priests that they were healed. But only one came back to give praise and thanksgiving to the Lord Jesus Christ for being healed. Matthew Henry, the famous Bible commentator, was robbed of his wallet one day. That evening, Matthew wrote in his daily journal. And the first thing he said was that he was thankful that it was the first time that he was robbed. Never had happened to him before. The second thing he wrote down is the only, they only took his wallet, not his life. He was thankful for that. And then he said, even though they took his wallet, they didn't get much. Obviously, he must have not had a lot of cash on him. Maybe they got his credit cards. I doubt if he had something back then. And then finally he said he was thankful that he was not the one who robbed. He would have rather been the one that was was being robbed instead of being the robber himself. So he made a list of things that he was thankful for, even in a bad situation. Then David says in verse 16 about God, You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Part of David's amazing amazement towards God or for God is that he cared about his creation even beyond humanity. And Jesus echoed that and he reminded us of that. In Matthew chapter 6, he points to the birds of the air and the fowls and the, 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 the grass in the fields and he tells us to learn from them. They are totally dependent on God. They don't worry They don't fret. They are totally dependent on God, and they don't worry. Someone said, worry is the misuse of one's imagination. Worry is the misuse of one's imagination. And a large percent of what we worry about never happens. Less than 85% of things that we worry about never happen. So it's the misuse of our imagination. Now in closing, verses 17 through 20, talking about God's unblemished righteousness. Verse 17, David says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Then he says, The Lord is nigh or near unto all them that call upon him in truth. And as I pondered about that, I made a list of some truths. As we 
Think of God, his graciousness, his righteousness, and uh, his works. And, and David says that God will draw near to those that will call upon him. The 86th Psalm, David says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. And I thought of calling upon the Lord. And as we call upon the Lord, what truth do we think of and consider as we call upon the Lord? Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12, wherefore as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. As we call upon God, do we consider the truths of our situation, that we are unrighteous and God is righteous and holy? But then in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. Tremendous promise, a tremendous truth. As we call upon the Lord, remember that as you call in truth, you will be saved. Then the truth to the question, how many ways are there to be saved? John 14, 6. Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way... The truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Acts 4.12 Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Another truth in John 8.24 Jesus said, Therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, Ye shall die in your sins. There he brings in the faith of calling upon the Lord. The truth about if we do not believe, we're going to die in our sins. Then Acts 4.37 and 38. After they heard Jesus preach at Pentecost. After Pentecost. They were pricked in their hearts. They said, Peter, what shall we do? Peter's response was, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And so as we call upon the Lord and we realize the Lord draws near to us, we call in truth, remembering that God is holy and righteous. We are sinners and there's only one way to God and that is through Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. Then verse 19. David says, He, God, will fulfill the desire of them that fear or reverence Him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The word fear means to reverence God. Simply means to reverence Him. It doesn't mean to be afraid of God as we use the term afraid. But it means to reverence God. Luke Kipfer and Fred Wagner's book that they wrote, Becoming a leader worth following, they ask the question, How big is the, audi is the audience in your life? How big an audience do you have? Do you live to please people? Or do you live to please God? Are people your audience? Or do, or do you have an audience of one? the Lord Jesus Christ. One of Satan's temptations to Jesus was that Jesus would fall down and worship him. And Jesus rebutted that temptation with a singular worship. He said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve or pay homage to. So as you live your daily life, is your audience singular? Do you live to please Jesus or do you live to please others? Now, I know that could be controversial. 
Those of you that are in business and you want to give service to your customers, you want to please them, you want to do what's right, you serve them. But as you serve them, are you doing it as unto the Lord? Or are you doing it as unto man? Colossians 3.16, Paul speaks of letting the word of Christ permeate our lives so that his word would be spontaneous and flowing through us to others. Then he says in verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, and he talks about some very common, everyday, practical things in our lives. As we do them, are we doing them as unto the Lord? Wives submitting to husbands. Do you do that as unto the Lord or do you do it because you have to? And I know that we're out of our place sometimes and it's hard to submit to us. But do you do it as unto the Lord? But husbands, we're, we're also named in here. He's, he says, husbands loving your wives. Do you do it as unto the Lord? Children, do you obey your parents as unto the Lord? Are you doing it to please the Lord? Then he says, fathers, not to be harsh with your children. Don't promote, provoke them to wrath. As you honor your children, as you serve them, as you discipline them, do you do it in a way that provokes them, or do you do it as unto the Lord? Then he says, servants or employees responding properly to employers. How do you respond to your employer? Do you do your work as unto the Lord, to please the Lord? And then uh, doing everyday life with singleness of heart, fearing God and reverencing God. Who is your audience? Do you have one audience, the Lord Jesus Christ, or are you doing and serving or walking your life as to please people? And then finally, verse 20 David says, the Lord preserveth all them that love him. The Lord guards all those who love him. Another uh, translation would be, the Lord guards or watches over all those who love him. Now the word preserve here could be a bit misleading in this verse, in this translation. Uh, David promises that God would... Uh, Look over, watch over all those that love him. And it makes it appear as if I love God, I'm going to have a charming life, a trouble-free life, an easy life. But David did not have a charming life. Not necessarily. Even though he was considered a man after God's own heart. And some of his most inspiring psalms that he wrote were penned not from his throne room. In royalty, sitting on a throne, king of Israel. But they were penned while he was running for his life, fleeing from his enemies, hiding in a cave, evading his own father-in-law, who was out to destroy him and to take his life. His entitlement to kingship was obscured by those closest to him. David, in 1 Samuel 17, came to the camp of Israel. And Eli, his older brother, his anger was kindled against him when he came to bring food and to see how his brothers were doing. And he was falsely accused by Eli, his brother, his older brother. He was falsely accused of being prideful, having pride and naughtiness in his heart. In all of this, David still was bold. And uh, when, he heard about, when he heard about Goliath, and how Goliath was bringing blasphemous words against the God of Israel. He went to Saul, 
And he said, let no man's heart fail because of him, Goliath. The servant will, thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. We all know the results. God was watching over David. And even though he was scorned at, laughed at, and his brothers were angry with him, God was watching over him. Luke 21, 16 through 18, Jesus said to his of their future if they follow him. And he said, You shall be betrayed both by parents and kinfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to put to death. Verse 17, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And so... Following God and God watching over us doesn't always necessarily mean that we'll have a charming life. However, David closes this psalm with, but all the wicked he will destroy. Talking about God. All the wicked he will destroy. Judgment of the wicked. Those who refuse to humble themselves before a righteous and holy God is also part of God's righteous unblemished action. David promises those who truly love God and submit to God are, will not be subject to God's judgment. God's judgment is reserved for those that refuse to the wicked, those who refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. And David assures us that we will not have to experience the judgment of God, part of God's unblemished righteous action. The Lord, the Lord God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we bow before you this morning, and we thank you for this psalm that David wrote about your graciousness, your mercy, and that you are a God of unblemished righteousness. And you entreat us to call upon you. You ask us to come into your presence, and you promise that you will be near to us if we call upon you in truth. And then, Lord, you promise us that you will fulfill the desire of our hearts, and you will watch over us. And you promise us that you will preserve us, all those that love you. And then, and finally, you say the wicked will experience your judgment and wrath. And that we can escape the wrath and judgment of God. Thank you this morning for forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the power of the blood that cleanses us. Thank you that we can call upon you in truth and you will draw near to us. Thank you for the testimony of David, of your graciousness and your goodness. Bless each one that is here today. Help us, Lord, to go through this week and to be bold and to talk about the works of Jesus in our lives, what you have done for us. Help us, Lord, not to be ashamed of you. Forgive us when we were ashamed of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.